So they set up the, the entire two guns and pointed it at a flock of emus, opened fire. How'd they go? The emus immediately scattered into small groups and buggered off in every direction possible. Did they get any? Not a lot. So this ruined the glorious plan of mowing them down quickly, conveniently, and en masse. The soldiers said, we've got to change our tactics. So they tried to ambush a, a flock of about a thousand. So they're holding <laughs> fire until they got close, you know, whites, whites of their eyes. How do we ambush emus? You've got to be very quiet. <laughs> So they're holding off, the emus are coming forward. Time to fire, one of the guns jams, and only a couple emus were killed. Hey, we got a couple. Of 20,000, whatever. So it quickly became clear they had wildly underestimated their enemy, and also their own abilities by the sounds of it. Cunning adversaries, the emus proved almost impossible to hit with machine gun fire, and they seemed able to shrug off even serious injury from bullets without breaking stride. <laughs> If I had a division of men who could carry bullets like that, I would take on any army in the world. Here's an idea. Enlist the emus in the army. Come and fight for us. We'll give you cash and wheat. <laughs> All the migration routes you can carry. So you're a keen hunter, right? You always have been. No. I thought so. Me too. You shouldn't have any trouble answering this question with your hunting experience. Ah, uh, okay. What are the hardest animals to kill with a gun? Uh, what do you reckon? Like a guppy. Really small fish. They move quickly. They move quickly, slippery. The bullets will just slide past them. Uh, bacteria? Yes. Not an animal. Things like elephants, right? Because they're huge and thick. Yeah, like, that's why they made elephant dense. Bl blunderbusses. Boosa blunders. Bl blunderby. They're hard to kill with I a gun. I think they're blunderby. Blundupuses. Blunderpusses. Yeah, that would, would be hard to kill with a gun. Hippos? Yeah. Apparently. Okay. Probably big, rhinos too. Big and hefty. Yeah, big same hefty, reason. leathery. Sea elephants, same reason. Grizzlies, apparently. Grizzlies have skulls like stainless steel helmets, you know, reinforced with rocks. <laughs> you, can, you can put a lot into a grizzly's head, apparently. I, I do love the evolutionary pathway that, that a bunch of animals have gone. It's like, let's really harden the head area yep. so we can use it as a battering ram. They leave the way squishy <laughs> so it's tasty if they do actually get through. Getting, getting down a bit, armadillos. Oh, who is shooting an armadillo? Texans. Come on. But armadillos are made out of a tank, right? Yeah, I get it. Less expected. Sea sponges. Okay. Because yeah. no central organs. You know, yeah, you blow you bits off them and there's yeah, still yeah, a yeah. sea sponge. Yeah, yeah. Even less expected, for me anyway. Like if you believe the experience of a bunch of World War I veterans turned into farmers in Western Australia, the hardest animal to kill with a gun might well be the most quintessentially Australian bird in existence. Oh, my God. Welcome to The Wholesome Show, the podcast that couldn't block the whole of science with a howitzer. That's a canon for our pacifist listeners. Block the whole of science. Oh, like block, like... Stopper it? Stopper it. I'm Will Grant. I'm Rod Lamberts. So, World War I vets. After World War I, Australian federal government gave thousands of discharged vets money, land, and the promise of a bright and shiny new agricultural life in the wheat belt region of Western Australia. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Yeah? The land wasn't... Always the best land. It was occasionally, let's face it, really shocks. Yeah, I know. Like, like we're giving away money. land for free. Yeah, to people who've never farmed before yeah. to grow wheat. And if I've learned anything from the two dollar bill or anything about Australian crazy. history, wheat. that uh, promises of the fecundity of the agricultural mm. land don't always come about. Yes. So it wasn't always easy for these men. Then the Great Depression hit, nineteen twenty nine. Federal government encouraged these guys to increase their crop, their wheat crops in uh -huh, particular. Uh -huh. And the promise, of course, was of delicious government subsidies. If it wasn't going as well as it could, the government would I, offer them some extra cash surely, to make it worthwhile. Surely these guys at the time were growing as much as they could. I mean, isn't that the farmer thing? You, you grow what you can. You don't. You know. There's not many situations where farmers are growing. I only feel like growing half, half of what yeah, I, I could. just want to do half. Or you fruit tree. Yeah. You don't. You don't put any fruit out. Just two branches. Yeah. Leave yeah. the rest just leafy. I, I thought that's what you did. I mean, I ain't no, no. farmer guy. So the feds, the federal government, they basically thought this is a great way to help Australia out of the, the depression or at least better weather the yeah, depression. Yeah, yeah. More wheat, give the farmers more money, etc. But in spite of the recommendations and the promise of the subsidies, which it seems weren't so much delivered as not delivered. Oh, oh. but they got the free land though. They got the land. But no subsidies. Well, they got some things. It's not clear how many things, but they didn't get all the things that they were told they would get. So despite all that, for some bizarre reason, wheat prices continued to fall. Oh. Hard to imagine. Obviously, the veteran farmers did the smart thing. They thought profits are falling per, you know, bushel or firkin or whatever you did, measure did, wheat in. I'm still not stuck on the economics here. Profits are falling per bushel. Let's so grow more. That was like, the smart thing. They went harder. Uh, grow more wheat. The Depression hits 29. By 1932, 
October. Things are getting pretty fucked up. And the farmers are both preparing to harvest the season's crops while simultaneously threatening to not deliver them to anyone in the country because they're getting pissed off with the feds. Okay. The feds were being a bunch of reneggers. All right. Okay. So the story so far is a bunch of World War I vets grow wheat in areas where wheat's hard to grow. Prices begin to plummet. Yep. So they grew more wheat, relying on government subsidies, only some of which actually happened. Okay. It's great. So things were looking about as bad as they could get for the farmers. Not quite. This is where about a 1,000 million emus cried out, hold my beer. So emus in this part of the country raise their broods inland. Then they routinely migrate en masse to the west coast in search of food and water. Are they a migratory board bird? They are a migratory board bird. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Only in as much as, you know, they have a little party time in the pants, lay the eggs, and then they all trundle off to the coast. Yeah, okay. Like most people do. But they're like salmon. They go- they They're go just like salmon. In stream to lay their eggs or something like that. Just they, like salmon. Yeah. And then you, they trot back. So they're migrating west towards the coast. And it turns out the land the vets were given had four awesome migrating emu positive features. One, it's already on their migration route. Well, that would be the number one one. I, 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 th- I think anything else <laughs> is, is, is kind of redundant yeah. at this point. Why do you stop at the big lobster? It's on the way. Two, the land has been conveniently well cleared, so it's easy to get around. Uh-huh. Extra water was being diverted to help grow the crops, so they have water. Also, there was the crops themselves, which were to emus. <laughs> Nummy. And the farmers don't want it anymore because it's, it's- Fuck it, you can't sell it. Grow yeah, exactly. more and let the emus All have right. it. So late 1932, a horde of something like 20,000 emus turned up in a town. 20,000 emus. Yeah, 20,000. This is guesstimates from the 30s. In towns like Chandler and Walgulan, which I've never heard of, but anyway, they all turned I'm up. I'm guessing they're not big towns. They're so not. So there's more emus than people here. There's an, and there's a lot of fields of wheat. Emu. Oh, you're right. emu <laughs> One emu, two emu. So the emus would eat a bunch of the crops, but not only did they eat them, they trashed them because they're big-footed oafs. Oh, and they'd also okay. smash the rabbit-proof fences. Well, because they had to go between them and num nums. Because they're buddies with the rabbits. They really are. The emus famously big friends of the rabbits. A like lot of the rabbits would ride in on the back of emus. So there's a report. I mean, we're, I'm going to step through it, but there was a report back in in 1953 that looked back on this period in the Sunday Herald. It described the emus as a uh, tough, prolific, gangling marauder of the sand plains, whose species ever since the beginning of agriculture in the state, mm-hmm. has invaded, in a frenzy of hunger, some of the finest fields at the time of ripening of the harvest to shear off crops with voracious beaks and to trample with great webbed feet. Can I just, uh, just mm. point, of, point of order on the mm. words there, mm. has invaded. Uh, just want to say, mm. just want to say, wheat-grown agriculture in this part of the land came after the emus. So well, I, I want to see your evidence. Emu. Don't have any. All I'm it? saying is, is it's likely that uh, emus being uh, native to Australia and probably, you know, hundreds and billions of years. Billions, uh, are you suggesting that the Sunday Herald in Sydney in 1953 may have been a little askew in its views about what belonged here and what didn't? Maybe, maybe. Apparently also they basically, for each one they ate, each wheat, what do you call it, prong, they'd probably smash about 100. <laughs> the wheat prong. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to eat that and travel on that. <laughs> well, fuck it. <laughs> This is delicious, especially when you just rub it on your body and throw so it away. So they're making crop circles there. They're just trashing yeah. everything around. One that they eat and crop circle around Trash it. the rest as, as a lesson to others. So the farmers at this stage, they're pretty wrecked. Before the horde came, they're already fucked. Everything's mm. horrible. Then the horde turns up. They're at their wit's end. They're also really mad with the federal politicians who'd encourage them to grow the wheat. And the then more the wheat. This is the farmers still. Uh, well, the farmers, I, the, I can imagine the emus might be mad at the federal politicians. The emus don't know who. All right, fair enough. They don't know the difference between the federal and the state. Or local. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So basically the pollies had encouraged them to grow the wheat to claim it because they claimed it ease the burden of depression, which it didn't. Sorry, the depression. I bet growing a lot of wheat eases your burden of depression no, as well. Eating it, that's what they said. Depression suggest. or the depression. If you have depression, eat a lot of wheat. Grow a lot of wheat. Grow a lot of wheat. No, that was it. that was the 1930s cure for, uh, for depression. Grow some wheat. And <laughs> cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Have a few durries, eat a piece of bread, chin up, <laughs> you'll be fine. So they're also shared with Parliament because um, they said they'd subsidise the crops, which they didn't. And West Australian farmers were having problems because equipment was really expensive to get over there and use. And they kept saying, we need help, but the feds kept saying, piss off. So it's no surprise at this point, the Wheat Growers Union in WA were enthusiastically supporting of the secession movement at the time, which was apparently in full swing. Carve WA off, sorry, Western Australia for our multinational listeners, from the rest of Australia. Yeah. Yeah. 
So their thinking was basically, we can do this on our own, or we're forced to. Fair enough. Yeah. Not helping us with our emu plague. So there's some argy-bargy between the different players. Then the federal government went, uh, hang on a minute, maybe we need WA. They could be useful to us as a country. Oh, really? I love you. Love you. Love you. So, yeah, Canberra, as they keep referring to it, Canberra. We're in Canberra. We aren't the government. The government happens to be here with us. The feds went, okay, let's, um, let's do something. So when the farmers heard this, they said, cool, we'll send a delegation. And part of that delegation was a deputation of ex-soldiers, as sure. you'd expect. And they went to see the Minister of Defence, Sir George Pierce, and they were met with a very receptive ear. He's like, I, I'm here to listen to you, gentlemen soldiers. But, but Minister of Defence, mm. their, their problem is with wheat prices and lack of, lack of support. How is the Minister of Defence solving their problem? Well, I have another problem. Have you already forgotten? Yeah, I get it. The emus, but it's also the Minister of Defence. Yeah. Like, like I, all of these are farming problems. But these are soldiers. <laughs> sure, but, you know, you go to the Department of Agriculture. To a man say, with a hammer. I have a problem I have a problem with wheat prices. I have a problem with uh, emu. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a soldier, so let's talk to the military. Still confused. Seems odd, right? Yeah. So because they're World War One vets, they're pretty familiar with how effective modern tools of war can be, and they're super- Keen on machine guns. Mm-hmm. So they asked for some. Can you just do that? Can we have some machine guns? <laughs> like if you've been in one war, can you just say, can I have, can I have some machine gun? Because my wheat's not being sold. <laughs> like is there is there some sort emus. of deal? After after a war, you're allowed to ask for stuff. Like You can choose one weapon. They asked for some machine guns. The minister, Sir George, <laughs> says, <laughs> fuck yeah, but there are some conditions. I mean, if you, if you have so many – surplus machine gun after the war. You're like, you're like, shit, they're a problem to even house. We might as well give them to anyone who asks for them. Give them to a drunken farmer like, from like WA. what the fuck? What, what world is this where you write to the government and say, can I have some machine gun? I like that. No, they went there. They went there. So the, the point is they went in person and that's how, you, like, they didn't zoom in. All right, fair enough. They actually enough. saw them face to face. Yeah, okay. Well, you, it's like turning up at the warehouse. Exactly. You shook the hand, you saluted the yeah, queen. Yeah, I talked and, to the minister. Can I have uh, some of your- Can I have some guns? So he said, yeah, but- the guns could only be used by active soldiers. Ah, oh, okay. Of which these farmers were not. No, they're, they're, they're retired. They're, they are retired. They're, they're vets. Yeah. Uh, troop transport to get those soldiers to WA had to be financed by the WA government, and the farmers would have to provide food, accommodation, and pay for the ammo. Okay. We'll send some soldiers with, with guns. the guns. You yeah. can't just use the guns yourself, no, no. but happy to solve your emu problem with some soldiers you and guns. You can't be trusted anymore. You've got to feed them, though. Exactly, and uh, transport them, etc. yeah. And he also added, Pierce just wanted to make sure he'd get extra support within his, you know, parliamentary colleagues. The birds would make great target practice. Sure. When we're fighting the Hun again, they'll they'll be like emus. Like we yeah, can- long legs, big bushy things, and no <laughs> arms. It's it's strange how weird the Germans in World War One they they looked like emus. You saw like, their expressions, right? <laughs> when threatened, they rear up and go. It's it's a strange <laughs> thing. Like German soldiers are famed for throwing their heads in the sand. That's ostriches. That is ostriches. <laughs> Can't tell these big birds apart. It's also been suggested, and it seems reasonable, the feds thought, this looks like a really nice, inexpensive way to show that we care about WA and they won't leave us. Oh, really? Yeah. This will be, this will stop secession. So, well, yeah, American listeners, help. you could have done this yeah. in the Civil War. Give them you some know, gun. You know, you stop the secession by- we'll, Shooting we'll pigeons. Shoot some ostriches Sending for soldiers to shoot pigeons for you. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not a thimble full of blood. So, with I this really- agreement in place, the Emu War began. So command of the Emu War troops was given to, this is a name, Major Gwynedd Purves Win Aubrey Methodith. No, that's not an Australian name. It is not. Gwynedd Purves Win <laughs> Aubrey, the top of the page. <laughs> where, where? Very top. Gwynedd Purves Win Aubrey Meredith. Oh, my God. Fucking hell. Oh, my God. Like, like I get that, you know, we're a multicultural society here in Australia. We not can 1932. Have, no, no <laughs> indeed. Indeed. We can have all names, but my word. That is a that is a gracious me. That is a Welsh Etonian right there. So he's of he's a major in the Royal Australian Artillery's Seventh Heavy Artillery because <laughs> birds and wheat. Mm. So the campaign was scheduled to kick off October 1932, but rain delayed play because basically it rained and the emus went uh, and they scattered. Don't like the wet. You know, they don't like the wet in a flock. They like to do wets in small groups. <laughs> Maybe you dry better. There's more surface area. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. 2nd of November, um, early in the morning, the 7th Heavy Battery got off the train at Campion in WA, which, and I know you're wondering where that is, it's about halfway between Perth and Kalgoorlie. Okay. 
So to be fair, it probably wasn't actually the whole battery. It was Major Meredith and at least two other soldiers, Sergeant McMurray and Gunnar O'Halloran. <laughs> it's a team of three. Not really a battery. It's a team of three. Yeah. The Major plus two dudes, a sergeant and a gunner. A Major, a sergeant and a gunner. I like the chain of command here. Yeah, like, like a major, we've, we've, no other officers. We've, we've got one officer, yeah. one one NCO to boss people around, and one person the to private do the work. equivalent. Yeah, like like yeah. it's like yeah. you do all the work, Gunner, and you've got two bosses here, and they and the orders are going to have to go through the sergeant from the major <laughs> chain of command. Yeah. The like major can't tell you. No, exactly. The major cannot talk to the gunner. Mm-mm. That'd be gross and wrong. <laughs> but it seems like from many of the sources I read, there may have been some support. Privates, gunners, equivalent. Okay. It's because uh, one, of, one or two of the sources talk about at one point getting the troops to surround emus. Ah. And I don't think three people can do a lot of surrounding. <laughs> but it could have been bad language as well. No, emus are scared by the triangle formation. They really like that, freak that, out. That one is the thing. A rhombus is fine. A straight line, I, no problem. I, you know, okay, if you are Roman soldiers fighting, you know, like, like the Greeks or something like that, yep. surround them and you can, you know, you can phalanx them to death. Cool. If cool. you're a couple of 1930s Australian soldiers. Well, there's two problems. One, one is you're fighting uh, birds. B- that birds. Are, that are fast. Birds. <laughs> fast like, birds. I don't think. And two, you're firing guns. Yeah. Like the circle formation is not great with, with ranged weaponry. And they're like, not small guns. <laughs> well. Which we'll get to. Yeah, okay. They unpacked when they got there, Campion. Two Lewis automatic machine guns, Lewis guns, 10,000 rounds of ammunition. So a Lewis gun, gas-operated, American originally, Okay. used heaps in World War One. It was the machine gun of choice. Oh, well, there you go. For the discerning World great War One. Great for gunning down cannon fodder. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, look, no man's land. Let's love, you, love your work, machine gunners. Remember remember that- uh, Not their fault. Not the, their fault. Well, the inventor of the machine gun thought this is the end to wars. Mm-hmm. No one would fight a war- in the, against with, this. With one of these? No. So it has a firing pan. I assume it's like a magazine that can hold around 100 rounds. It can fire 500 rounds a minute. Cool. That seems a bit imbalanced, but anyway. So how many rounds? It can, can fire 500 a minute. And how many does it hold? 100. You can fire for 10 seconds. Yeah, like. <laughs> great. We just got to go. You got to do it squirts. Controlled fire. <laughs> but I guess you don't want to slow it down so you can fire longer. Like that would that that defeats the purpose. Defeats some purposes, gunning. yeah. This is not a Lewis gun podcast. No, it's not. If you want more information about the Lewis gun or any other guns. Go elsewhere. Or don't. Stop it. Or stay you, away. You, yeah, don't, you right. don't need information about guns. Look oh, up cool. nukes like a normal person. So the soldiers, the current and former soldiers, were both very confident the birds were fucking cooked. Like, we got uh, these guns yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are fucked. Yeah, Remember, we, it's we are going to see emu feathers in the sky for miles chunks around. Chunks of That's emu it. meat. Yeah, well, that too. I, I'd be roasting me some emu. And foots. I've eaten emu. It's fine. It just tastes like bird. So they set up the, the entire two guns and pointed it at a flock of emus. Open fire. How'd they go? The emus immediately scattered into small groups and buggered off in every direction possible. They're like, fuck this, boom, gone. It's as if it was raining. Did they get any? Not a lot. Oh. So this ruined the glorious plan of mowing them down quickly, conveniently, and en masse. Straight away, it was like, oh, that didn't work. Two days into the operation, the soldiers said, we've got to change our tactics. So they tried to ambush a, a flock of about a 1,000. So they're holding <laughs> fire until they got close, you know, f- whites, whites of their eyes. So they're holding off. They're holding ambush. off. They're How holding do we off. ambush emus? Is it like- you've got to be very quiet. <laughs> so they're holding off. They're holding off. They're holding off. They're holding off. The emus are coming forward. They get ready. Time to fire. One of the guns jams and only a couple of emus were killed. Hey, we got a couple. Of 20,000, whatever. So it quickly became clear they had- Wildly underestimated their enemy, wildly, and also their own abilities by the sounds of it. Cunning adversaries, the emus proved almost impossible to hit with machine gun fire, and they seemed able to shrug off even serious injury from bullets without breaking stride. <laughs> Major Meredith, he's done a few reports, but one of the comments in his one of in his report said, um, the emu is an amazingly hard bird to kill outright. Many carry mortal wounds of a distance up to half a mile. It is more than astonishing, it is miraculous. If I had a division of men who could carry bullets like that, I would take on any army in the world. Here's an idea. Enlist the emus in the army. That would solve a lot of problems. Then, no. then the Germans would, would retreat. Yes, they would. Like if they had only said to the emus, look, come and fight for us. We'll give you cash and wheat. <laughs> all, the, all the migration routes you can carry. So these basically they're going, holy shit, these guys are immortal, impossible to kill, crazy. So let's pause for a moment and learn about emus. All right. So they're one of the largest birds on the planet, as we know. How tall? About 185 centimetres. So they get to about six feet tall. 
Sure. They weigh 30 to 50 kilos, which is, you know. Uh, that's not so big. I, I, I carry more girth than that. Yeah, you're, you're only 65, That's not so right? impressive. Yeah, exactly. But you're not exactly. A, but you're not a bird and you have arms. That's some serious tuck shop business going. Yeah, they can run at 50 kilometres an hour. All right. Pretty fucking fast. They're very intelligent, allegedly, and they no, travel in packs. No, they're not. This is according to- Very intelligent compared with other giant birds. According to sources. Yeah, look, look, anytime I've encountered emu- I have not uh, thought. Intelligence is not the first thing you thought. I have not thought, thought. My God. Like, you know, you, you see a cockatoo or, or a galah or any other sort of parrot and 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 these things look like they're, smart. They're watching you and they're working you out. Yeah, exactly. And Amy just looks at you and goes, do you have a sandwich that I can steal? Yeah, exactly. Look at this neck. Yeah. I could get that sandwich from <laughs> a long distance. <laughs> and if your intelligence test is stealing sandwiches from a picnic. They'll kill it. I, They'll kill it. It's awesome. You're highly intelligent, let's say, for birds. I'm not buying their intelligence. Yeah. So emus are not usually aggressive as a rule. I mean, they have big, strong legs. That apparently, they can kill a dingo, etc. When they're startled, they jump and they kick. Yeah. As you'd expect. That's what your big birds do. And they don't attack with their beaks because those bits are soft. They try to keep their heads and necks out of the way. they got a soft beak? Yeah, apparently. Really? Hmm. Quite squishy. <sighs> and the neck, obviously, is like a- Oh, it's a vulnerable bit. Yeah, it's like Like a, that's the, the, the soft underbelly of Europe. And it, and it is definitely not a weapon of mass de- or even minor destruction. So basically, they're not aggressive, but they're pretty fast. They can kick hard, etc. This is all the information I read. But what I didn't see was anything about them being bulletproof, and certainly nothing spoke about them being geniuses. Wow. Regardless, the soldiers who were shooting at these poor buggers began to, quote, credit the enemy with unlikely military resources. <laughs> we're in fucking Jurassic Park here. We really are. Like, like <laughs> unlikely resources. I like the resources. What? So the soldiers started to report that the emus appeared to have picked pack leaders to stand watch. Oh, okay. Aid in their escape, and they developed, quote, guerrilla tactics. Oh, stop it. For example. <laughs> stop it. Each mob has its leader, always an enormous black-plumed bird standing fully six feet high who keeps watch while his fellows busy themselves with the wheat. At the first suspicious sign, he gives the signal, and dozens of heads stretch up out of the crop. See, I don't know if that's a leader. I think that's a scout. It can be both. All right. A few of the birds will take fright once they see that happening. They'll start sprinting off into the scrub and the leader stays until everyone's reached safety. Oh, that's a leader. There you go. Exactly, scout leader. So the claim is they had these scouts, etc. But Meredith, the major, was not going to be foiled by fucking birds. He's like, no, nope, screw this shit. Not going to happen. So he gets a Lewis gun mounted onto a farmer's truck. Nice. Yeah. But it turns out when you add the gunner itself, the gun – 30 pounds. The vehicle couldn't actually keep up with the emus. This is a 1930s truck it as is. well. We're, we're not Farmers talking- truck on rough terrain. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is not your modern Ford Wild Track. This it's is, not. This it's is not. 1930s here. Mm-hmm. Patoot, patoot. It's a Model T plus Yeah, the horn goes, other. <laughs> Also, the bumpy ride made it impossible to aim the gun properly. So apparently no shots were fired from the back of the truck at all. But one farmer decided to try and use the, the car to run down a slow, straggling emu. Cool. So he went for Do you know that run. that improves the fitness of the flock, though? Yes. Like if you kill get rid the, of the borfers, you get rid of the borfers, the yep. flock goes faster. So, yeah. you know, no borf breeding. You have to kill the hardest ones first. So they didn't do that. And this borfer, to be fair, maybe not such a borfer. So the hit and run, the farmer goes for the thing, hits the emu, it smashes through the car and gets tangled in the steering wheel. Oh. Then the truck runs off the road, plows through several feet of fence, and then comes to a grinding halt. It was a kamikaze emu? And a kamikaze truck, it would seem like that didn't work either. So the emu war was not going well. Okay. Within a week of first contact, troops were recalled. They said, fuck it. They reckon around 2,500 rounds had been fired and they killed somewhere between 50 and 200 emus out of 20,000. Mm. But it, that, maybe they'd scared a bunch off. Yes. Because these emus are smart enough to have leaders. Maybe they might the be leaders have gone, Dudes, scared off the migration. We're going to go to the east like coast. That. It's safer. So, and Meredith did report, though, the major, at least none of his men had suffered any casualties. So that's good. <laughs> Great. Literally, he reported that. Well, no, I guess- No casualties. You got to. He's a military command. You have to. Yeah, you're right. So, 8th of November, the Australian House of Representatives had a chat about the operation. So they're in Parliament. <laughs> How's it going over there? <laughs> There's a bad instinct in all of us. It's like, I wish there was something more exciting going on. Than of course. It'd be interesting. Yeah. You know, give, yeah. us, give us a weird dictator or a nuclear war yeah. or something like that. Fuck some uh, shit up. Uh, but- you know, this idea that Australian Parliament is debating uh, a fight with some emus, mm. it really does say something about, you know, this is, this is 
simpler quiet time. times. Simpler, simpler time. times, yeah. Between betwixt the wars. <laughs> So, yeah, they're debating in the House of Reps. So an opposition smart-ass chimes up and says, would a medal be minted for yeah. the people who participated in this conflict? Of fucking course. Mm. And a federal Labor parliamentarian said, of course, any medals that would go to anyone, they should go to the emus because they'd won every round so far. <laughs> well, it seems true. It's true. It is true. It's just it was very witty. And of the defence minister, George Pierce, he earned the unofficial title of minister for the emu war. So, of course, the local media jumped up and down and went, this is a complete clusterfuck. And so Pierce withdraws the troops. November 8, it's out. Uh, Done. Cooked. What? And after the withdrawal, Meredith says, if we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world, as mentioned earlier. With the bullet-carrying capacity bullet of these carrying. birds? Do you mean like, like taking bullets? Yep, taking bullets. Not- so they're saying they hit them. They're claiming that. Or when they noticed they hit them, they didn't seem to care much or at least yeah, took a while yeah, to care. Yeah. But he goes on to say they're like Zulus. Cool. Whom even dum-dum Whoa. bullets could not stop. Whoa. So apparently the Zulus were impervious to bullets oh. too in his experience or at least his reading. I get, blah, look. I know. Problematic times. Mm, weren't they? It was a tad colonial back then. Mm, mm, mm. As opposed to these perfect times in which we live now. No, I know, but, but – uh, mm. A dum dum bullet, I think, explodes or something, or fucks no, it up, shatters it's, things. It's, it's a hollow top, so so, so it has. It, it, it's like it's got a carved out bit, but once it hits the skin, then it uh, then it will burrow through the body in a, in a totally. So it'll have an entry wound like, uh, like that, yeah. and an exit wound like that. Small hole at the front, nothing in the back. Huge hole at the back. Like they they have right. been banned for a long time in uh, in the world. In the civilized world, world. In, in in the civil like I don't I don't even know in the non civilized world wherever that is a regular bullet is designed to stop an enemy soldier potentially kill them but stop and kill rather than fuck up their lives forever yeah, yeah. okay unless you're apparently a Zulu warrior in which case it doesn't matter <sighs> just like an emu according to Major Meredith so at the time Sunday Herald reports one of the members of the I assume the war party so one of the soldiers saying. There's only one way to kill an emu. Shoot him through the back of the head when his mouth is closed. When his mouth is closed. Yep. Otherwise he'll catch the bullet and what, why does the mouth? Don't know. Or shoot him through the front of his mouth when the mouth is open. That's how hard it is. <laughs> so the point really is it's very specific. <laughs> and it's back of the head with the mouth closed or front of the. Mm. So battle number one goes to the emus. Round one, so after round one is over, the emu attacks on crops unabated continue. Farmers keep asking for help. The Premier of Western Australia, whose name I didn't record, I'm sure it was like Keith Sm- Snell. Mr. Premier. Mr. Hello. Premier. He was very vociferous in his support for the renewal of military assistance. Let's do it again. Let's get some more soldiers. There are other solutions nope. to- Just guns. Machine guns. If you think about it, it's obvious. Yeah. I feel like, you know, a couple of lion. Just drop some lions in. Fucking great. Imagine if Australia was chock full of lions. 400 dingoes. You know lions would go off in this country too. It would be like we introduced one or two flocks of lions, whatever they call it, hordes. Definitely flocks. Mobs. It's a flock of lion. And they go off. <laughs> so the, the Western Australian Premier is very supportive and at around the same time as he was being supportive, apparently there was a report from the base commander, and I'm not sure who the base commander was. It might have been Meredith, but it's no, not. It's got to be Major Meredith. Yeah. And he said that 300 emus had been killed in the first operation which is apparently successful enough for the minister, Sir George, to approve the resumption of military efforts on oh. the 12th of November. So how long do we postpone for? A couple of days. Oh, okay. Let's eighth, just pause and count 12. stock. Yeah, this yeah. is It's a- the 8th they pull out. On the 12th, um, the, the minister goes, yeah, go for it. So the military again says, okay, we'll lend you guns. But he expected that the, the military, the Western Australian government, sorry, expected that they would provide necessary people, again, the military, et cetera, but apparently um, there was a lack of experienced machine gunners in WA, which I find hard to believe. But anyway, that was the story. So Major Meredith is back in. He dives back in. So war number two, November 13 and 14, 1932, around 40 emus were killed. 40 out of 20,000, and that's just one herd. Well, out of 19,970. Right, right. They have lost a couple. Some may have been born as well, though. So that's November 13, 14. November 15, day three, was, quote, far less successful. <laughs> <laughs> so it gets a little confusing here, but it looks like Meredith was recalled on or sometime before December 10. So less than a month later, his final report claims 986 confirmed kills using 
9,860 rounds, so exactly 10 per confirmed kill. Okay. Coincidence. He also claimed exactly 2,500 wounded birds had died from their injuries. Again, very precise. Sure. He's okay. a military man. He likes precision. He's an artilleryist. Mm. So despite all the issues with machine gun culling efforts, the farmers continued to request military assistance in 1934, 1943, 1948 at least. They went, can we do it again? I just, I, why, why are they still believing that this is the pathway out of this? Because guns. Like, my God, I know that they're Western Australian, like that. Like and vets. Vets. Like the point being that they're vets, they're given some land and they're like, okay, the solution to this is guns. Is, is guns. Throw more guns at them. Like, ah, there's not a lot of biological problems we've solved with guns. Not many. Luckily, the feds refused every request. They said, nope. Uh, we're, done. we're done. Smart federal government. We're, they're, they're, we're, they? we're only doing this twice. Fool yeah. me, fool me once, then shame on me. No, fool always me. shame on you. <laughs> we're politicians. It's always fool shame on you. Fool me quite a few times. Still you. Shame on something. But- Some other cunt. <laughs> so in the end, it was a bounty on the emus that was the most effective. So between the, the one started in 1932. There you go. Didn't go so well, but they tried. Paid the dingoes. Pretty much. So between 1945 to 1960. They kept what, – what, 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 hang on. This kept going. <laughs> My timeline was like we were in 1930s here. Yeah, so the, the war was in the thir- early 30s, 32. Yeah. The, the bounty was put in place around that same time. That kept rolling. Oh, my God. So – and the only numbers I could find, 45 to 1960, 284,000 emus were knocked off. I – Bounties claimed. I don't like more than that a quarter we became of a million. more successful at killing things. Do you eat meat? I'll, Do you eat meat? You eat meat. Yeah, you but like, they're, they're freaking like native things. animals. Like, well, delicious like, native animals. Why do we – oh, I do like the policy worked. Well, yeah. And you are a policy guy. That's yeah, that's true. what I care that's about. True. All I care about is knowing if the policy achieved the goal, exactly. then, we can, then we can tweak. Absolutely. But, so the other thing that helped was, you know, a fence. A fence? Yep. So by 1953, the Western Australian government had spent in, the, in their times 52,000 pounds – for a 215-kilometre emu-proof fence. WA is much bigger than 215 kilometres. Not that bit. Oh, just the short bit of WA. The, the little bit. The neck. The emu bit. Yeah, the neck. Exactly. Ne- <laughs> the famous neck the, of the, WA. Of WA. The goiter. <laughs> the goiter. So the emu fence was actually adapted from an existing fence originally constructed to, surprise, surprise, keep out rabbits. Well, we just upgraded it. Yep, we did. Made it taller. We made it emu you know, and we're still doing it. Yeah, we are. We're, we're, this is the thing. This this fence, they call it the state barrier fence. It's more than 1,200 kilometres long now. Mm, mm. And it plays a critical role in stopping the emus. <sighs> often often the way it does this is by trapping them and maiming them so they die of thirst or get like, picked off by dingoes. Come on. They get tangled and shit, so that's great. Did, were we still making fences on native animals? Well, and rabbits. Okay. Which fence those fuckers. Yeah, Whatever. Which aren't native to here. Whatever. They're native to somewhere. But seriously, you can have a 30 centimetre fence, fence out some rabbits. You know, rabbits, rabbits, we all know, can historically get fucked from Australia. We don't need them. Emus, emus, they got a right. They were here first. They were here first. That's why they're, they're on our coat of arms. Um, yeah, exactly. And we, of course, eat them. Yeah, but people eat their coat of arms all the time. I've like, got no problem English, with it. English eat unicorn all the time. They do. Like, that's, they're famous. that's how they have, they keep the royal family going. Exactly. With unicorn blood. So basically the Australian Army lost – they lost the war to the emus. They, that, how many casualties? Australia lost no humans. Uh, how many emus lost? At least nine. Well, there you go. Who won? No one. Anyway, so they lost. They lost the war to the emus. So one last thing. There's a movie. Well, there was a movie planned. So John Cleese wrote a version of a tale called <clears throat> The Great Emu War. He decided it was a very funny idea. Production was originally set for 2022 with Moby – Apparently going to do the soundtrack. So obviously Moby. You're thinking Emu War? Moby. I would have thought more. Do you remember Moby? Yeah, like uh, like every ad in 1998. Moby. Uh, on t- but also, oh. you know, it's quite a nice dance. Oh, I like, think Moby's very relaxing. Uh, maybe he's into soundtracks. Maybe he's into killing emus. He probably is. So John Cleese, Rob Schneider, oh. Camilla Cleese, Cleese's daughter, and Jim Jeffries from Australia, they wrote the final script at the beginning of 2021. And they'd hoped, Cleese said, to start shooting within a few months. So probably 2022, 2023. It looks like it didn't happen, at least not so far. Uh-huh. But it gets better because a troupe of Australian comedians did make a movie. What? I know. So Umbrella Entertainment and Hot Dad Productions had the first screening of their version of the Emu Wars, October 2023. 
You gonna go watch it? I've seen the trailer and it is fucking spectacular. Like it is, it's so quintessentially and ridiculously Australian. There's butt jokes, fart jokes, two dudes kissing to stay warm. There's terrible special effects. Like the the one and a half minute trailer is gold plated, awesome, ridiculous. It's in the show notes, obviously, if you want to find it. So yes, there's at least one movie and maybe another with uh, uh, his himself, John Cleese, in charge. Beautiful. So the Australian Army lost. Ah. Uh. But movies, uh, movies apparently are winning. No, look, I'm I'm going to go for obviously the Emu here. Yeah, they're the they're the winners. No, I was on their side from the beginning. Of course you were. You could oh, tell. I was. Yeah.